Hello everyone, my name is Nela Tarao and I'm a PhD student and a PMRF fellow in the Department of Biological Sciences and Bioengineering, IIT Kanpur. Today, we will continue with the next lecture of the chapter Biomolecules. So, till now, we have studied about the classification of, uh, we were studying about the enzymes and then we saw about the class classification of the enzymes. Now, in today's lecture, we will see what are the types of enzymes and then some other things about the enzymes. So, let's start. So, first topic is uh, types of enzymes. So, there are two types of enzymes and this type is based on the nature of the enzyme. Okay. So, there are two types of enzymes. The first type is simple enzyme. So, what are simple enzymes? Simple enzymes are proteinaceous in nature. So, we have studied about the enzymes that enzymes are proteins with two exceptions, right? So, simple enzymes are the ones that are proteinaceous in nature. Prote proteinaceous nature means they are made entirely of pro protein. So, their entire composition, their entire composition is protein. Okay. Now, what is the example of simple enzymes? So, the example of simple enzyme is, one of the example is trypsin. The trypsin, it is used in the digestion system. So, this is proteinaceous in nature and hence come into simple enzymes. Now, the, the second type of enzyme is known as conjugated enzymes. So, what are conjugated enzymes? So, it consists of two parts. The first is the protein part. So these enzymes, they are also majorly of protein, but along with protein, they have other parts as well. So they consist of protein parts and non-protein parts. Okay, so they have protein parts and non-protein parts. And this non-protein part, it is very essential for the functionality of protein. So it is very essential for the functionality of the protein. Okay, and what are these parts of the uh, conjugated enzymes are called? So, protein part is known as apoenzyme. So, the protein part is known as apoenzyme. And this non-protein part, it is known as cofactors. Okay, so the protein part is known as apoenzyme and the non-protein part is known as cofactors. And these two together are known as holoenzyme. So, holo means you can remember this by like whole. So, the whole enzyme comprises of apoenzyme and cofactors. So, this holo enzyme is nothing but it is a conjugated enzyme and it has two parts that is apoenzyme and cofactors. Now, what are these cofactors? So, the cofactors are again of different types. Okay. So, the cofactors are all also of different types based on the nature. So based on the nature, based on the nature, cofactors of different type. The first is the organic cofactor, right? That consists of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and uh, these three, and which carbon is covalently bonded with other carbon molecule. So these are organic in nature. Now, this organic cofactors are further are of two types. The first one is coenzyme. Okay, so coenzyme is an organic cofactor. Now, what is co coenzyme? So coenzymes are those organic chemicals or compounds that are loosely bound. They are lo loosely bound to the enzyme. Okay, so they are loosely bound to the enzyme. Okay, so they can be easily removed from the enzyme. Now, the important thing about these coenzymes are they are not permanently bound to the enzyme. So these are not permanently, not permanently bound to the enzymes. Okay. So they are not permanently bound to the enzymes. It means these are transient in nature. Transient means for a short period of time. Okay. And, and when does this coenzyme bind? So because they are not permanently bound, 
so they binds to the enzyme when the substrate binds to the enzyme okay so they bind when so they bind to the enzyme when substrate binds so when bind when substrate binds so when substrate comes and bind to the enzyme at the same time this coenzymes also come and bind to the enzymes okay and help in the catalysis of the reaction now what are the examples of this coenzymes so one of the example of this coenzyme mostly these coenzymes are derived from the vitamins okay so before moving to the example so let's write one more important thing that they are derived from the vitamins okay they are derived from the vitamins for example so one of the example is we know about a uh, vitamin that is vitamin b1 it is also known as thiamine so thiamine is vitamin b1 and this vitamin b1 helps in the synthesis of a coenzyme that is known as tpp and what does this tpp stands for so this tpp it stands for thiamine it stands for thiamine pyrophosphate it stands for thiamine pyrophosphate okay it stands for thiamine pyrophosphate similarly there is this second vitamin that is known as niacin there is second vi vitamin that is known as niacin and this niacin it helps in the synthesis of coenzyme that is nadph and nadp so these are the two coenzymes that are synthesized by niacin okay similarly so this is one type of uh, organic cofactor that is coenzyme now the second type of organic cofactor is known as prosthetic groups so the second type is known as prosthetic groups now what are prosthetic groups so the prosthetic groups are the one that are tightly bound to the enzyme okay the coenzymes are the one that are loosely bound while the prosthetic groups are the one that are tightly bound so these are tightly bound to the enzyme and also unlike coenzymes these are permanently attached to, to this enzymes okay so they are permanently attached these prosthetic groups are permanently attached by covalent bond by covalent bond okay and what are the examples of prosthetic groups so one of the example of prosthetic group is heme so heme is a prosthetic group that is present in present in enzymes like catalase present in enzymes like catalase and peroxidase they are present in the enzymes like catalase and peroxidase okay so these are about the cofactors and basically the organic cofactors now the next cofactor that we will study is inorganic cofactor okay so the second type of cofactor is inorganic cofactor so inorganic cofactor so they are inorganic in nature such as it can be metals or non metals so it can be metal or non metal and since they are metals so they attach to the enzyme they attach to the enzyme via coordinate bonds so they attach via coordinate bonds okay the prosthetic groups they attach via uh, covalent bonds while this inorganic compounds or inorganic cofactors they attach to the enzyme via coordinate bonds and what are the examples of inorganic cofactors so one of the example is chloride ion so chloride or this is chloride ion that is present in the salivary amylase so this is present in the enzyme that is present in our saliva that is salivary amylase similarly the second inorganic cofactor is zinc ion 
and it is present in enzymes like carboxypeptidase. So zinc ion is present as a cofactor in enzyme like carboxypeptidase and, and alcohol dehydrogenase. Alcohol dehydrogenase. Thirdly, one more important cofactor is magnesium ion. So this magnesium ion, it is present in one of the important enzyme of glycolysis that is exokinase. When we will see a study glycolysis, we will see. So it is present in hexokinase and also in enzyme such as ribisco. So we have studied about ribisco, right? So this is the most abundant enzyme or the most abundant protein in the entire biosphere. And it is used in the photosynthesis, used in photosynthesis, right? So this rubisco consists of magnesium ion that is an important cofactor for the functioning of this enzyme. So we have seen that there are two types of cofactors, organic and inorganic. In the organic, again, based on their pattern of binding, they are divided into coenzymes and prosthetic groups. Now, next we will see about the graphical representation of how enzyme works. Okay, so in last class, what we had studied that how enzyme function. And we also wrote one equation for that. And the equation was that the enzyme, the substrate comes to enzyme, right? And it binds, when it binds to enzyme, it forms a complex that is known as enzyme substrate complex, right? And we also remember that this step is reversible. That it means that this enzyme substrate complex can further dissociate to form enzyme and substrate, right? So this step was reversible. And this enzyme substrate complex, what it was called? This was called as transient state. It was called as transient state. Then this enzyme substrate complex was converted into enzyme product complex, right? So it was converted into enzyme product complex. And further, this enzyme product complex, in this enzyme product complex, the product got released. And then this enzyme again get ready to bind with new substrate, right? So this transient state is not only enzyme substrate complex, but it also has enzyme product complex. So this complete state is the transient state. And what we know about a transient state? The transient state are short-lived. These are short-lived state. So they form for a very short period of time. Okay. Now, this was the equation through which we are showing how enzymes function. But if you want to represent it graphically, how will we represent? Let's see. So for graphical representation, what happens? So we have seen this reaction that and substrate is getting converted into product. So if you draw an if we draw x and y axis, so on the x axis we will represent the progress of the reaction. Okay, the enzyme, the substrate is getting converted into product. So we can write in on the x axis reaction progress. Okay, and on the y axis, what we have to write? We have to write potential energy. So it is the ener energy of substrate and product that is represented in potential energy. Okay. Now, since first our substrate is getting converted into product, we will write substrate here, submere here, and the product that side here. Okay. Now, this substrate gets converted to the product. If you map it onto this, or you try to represent it graphically, you will see a representation like this. So the substrate, if you see, it has higher energy. Right, and the product has lower energy. But for our, for converting, uh, for the substrate to get converted into the product, it has to first reach to a even higher state of energy, and then it drops and then get converted into product. Okay, so this is what how a substrate is uh, gets converted into the product if you represent it graphically. Now, this is a condition without enzyme. So here. This situation is without, without enzyme. Okay. This situation is without enzyme. If enzyme is not present. 
Now, what we are seeing that this substrate has this energy, right? This substrate has this energy, and this product has this energy. But this substrate, instead of getting converted from here to here, it is getting converted or it is getting to the higher energy state, then coming back to a lower energy state for getting converted to product. So what does this energy is? So this energy, this energy is the energy that is required for the substrate to reach before getting converted into the product. And this energy is represented by activation energy. So what this energy is, it is I am representing it via Ea. And Ea is the activation energy. It is the activation energy. Now, what is the activation energy? So, if we see via the graph, what we can say that it is a kind of energy barrier, right? That a substrate must cross in order to get converted into product, right? Because the substrate first have to reach from here to here, and then it comes back to form the product. So, activation energy is what? It is the energy barrier. We can write that it is the energy barrier that a substrate has to cross. That a substrate has to cross has to cross in order to get converted into in order to get converted into product. Converted into product. Okay, and this substrate, one more important, this substrate is, all, substrate is also known as reactant. Okay, so if you see reactant, it is same as substrate. Okay, so this is an energy barrier that a substrate has to cross in order to get converted into product, right? And what is this state? What is this maximum state? So this is transition state. For if, As we can see from this graphical representation, that the substrate is not getting directly converted into the product. It has various intermediate or transient state, right? So this is the transient state. So this state is the transient state. This state is the transient state. And from this, what we can see that the transient state has high energy, right? So apart from being short-lived, this transient state has high energy. The transient state has high energy. Okay. And this is the energy barrier that the substrate has to cross. Now, apart from this, what we can also write about the activation energy, that the activation energy is what? It is an energy difference, right? Energy difference between the substrate and the intermediate state, right? This is this energy difference. This is the intermediate state. This is the substrate energy. Then what we can write about the activation energy, that it is the average, it is the average energy difference. Why I'm saying, saying difference? Because this is your transient state, that P, and the substrate is somewhere, energy is somewhere here. So this difference, this is a difference that a substrate has to cross. And this difference is between the intermediate state and, and the substrate energy state. So we can write that the activation energy is the average energy difference between substrate, between substrate and intermediate state and intermediate state right so this is that energy difference now what does enzyme do so if we talk about the enzyme so the function of enzyme here is to reduce this activation energy so if you catalyze a reaction in the presence of an enzyme or if you run a reaction in the presence of enzyme then your graph will plot something like this. Okay, so your graph will plot something like this. So, this is with enzyme. This is with enzyme. So, what we are seeing here, that what enzyme is doing, now you have to cross this much barrier only, right? This will be your new activation energy. So, what the enzyme is doing, enzyme is, what the enzyme is doing, Enzyme is decreasing the activation energy, right? It is decreasing the activation energy. Now, it means that now less energy will be required for the substrate to get converted into product, right? So this is the function of enzyme actually. 
how it increases the rate of reaction because it decreases the activation energy or the energy that is required to get uh, to uh, the energy that is a barrier for the substrate in order to get converted into the product okay so this is important so this is what a uh, enzyme do and this is how we can see it graphically now this is also given in the ncert so here you will have transition state that is the peak state and then we have activation energy without enzyme and then activation energy with enzyme that is we can see is less right now we uh, you we guys have must we have must studied about two types of reaction the endothermic and the exothermic reaction now let's see briefly that what are these reaction and how do we represent it graphically okay so first we will see about the endothermic reaction endothermic reaction so what is endothermic reaction so the endothermic reaction is the one that requires energy for the reaction to happen so it requires energy from the outside okay it requires energy from outside for the reaction to happen for the reaction to happen and by reaction what i mean so it is for reaction to happen now what i mean by reaction means that substrate for the substrate to get converted into the product right so this is endothermic reaction it requires energy from outside now in this case if you want to represent it graphically how would you represent it so in this case what happens since the energy is required it means the substrate energy is low so you will represent a graph like this okay so what we are seeing this is substrate this is product so what we can see that in this case substrate energy is less than product energy right so this is substrate energy and this is product energy that i am representing by pe and sc and in the case of endothermic reaction the substrate energy is less than the product energy now if you look at the activation energy in this case so activation energy we also always have to draw from the level of the substrate and this is your intermediate state that is the peak state so this is the intermediate state or the transition state okay intermediate or transition state so in this case your activation energy is this much this is your activation energy okay now next type of uh, uh, reaction is exothermic reaction so next type of reaction is exothermic reaction now what is exothermic reaction so in the exothermic reaction energy is released okay so when the reaction happens energy is released okay energy is released during reaction and by reaction i means by uh, reaction what i mean is conversion of substrate to product so during the exothermic reaction energy is released okay so if we want to draw or graphically represent it how would we how will we represent so in this case energy is released it means the product energy will be less and the substrate energy will be high right so this is your substrate this is a product and your activation energy will be this much right your activation energy will be this much so if we what here what we have to write that the substrate energy is greater than the product energy so from these two what obs what observation we can make so we can see that in the case of endothermic reaction the activation energy is higher right we can see from the graph itself so in endothermic reaction we can write that in endothermic reaction the activation energy is high activation energy is comparatively high comparatively means in comparison to exothermic right so activation energy is comparatively comparatively high right so comparatively means in comparison to exothermic reaction the in the case of endothermic reaction the activation energy is high okay so this is the graphical representation now so we have seen how enzyme works and we have seen it in the form of equation as well as in the form of graphical representation as well now let's see what are the factors that affect the enzymatic activity 
so before moving that to that the question is how the how these factors or how the factors that i'm going to tell you uh, can affect the enzyme activity so we know that the enzyme is made up of protein right so enzyme enzyme is mostly made up of protein right and this protein have certain structure primary secondary tertiary and parenchymally and this enzyme they exist in tertiary structure they exist in tertiary structure so what these factors do these factors disrupt this tertiary structure okay and we also know that this tertiary structure is responsible for the activity of the enzyme this structure because this structure is very specific for a particular substrate to bind to it hence this tertiary structure is responsible for enzyme activity so this factors what does this factors do so this factors they disrupt the tertiary structure so the the factors this factors the factors disrupt disrupt the tertiary structure and hence they disrupt the shape of the enzyme and by this way they affect the enzymatic activity now what are these factors so the factors the first factor is temperature the first factor factor that affect the enzymatic activity is temperature the second is ph third is substrate concentration third is substrate substrate concentration can also affect that enzymatic activity concentration and the fourth is inhibitors fourth is inhibitors so we will see one by one how these factors affect the activity of the enzyme so let's start with the first factor that is temperature so what does temperature do so uh, it is said that when we increase the temperature so if we increase the temperature okay if we increase the temperature to certain extent then the activity of enzyme increases okay it is said that the activity of enzyme activity of enzyme increases okay now the question is why okay why this happens so it happens because we have studied when we were studying that how enzyme functions or so what we saw that the substrate comes and bind to the enzyme's active site right substrate come and bind to the enzyme active sites and how does this substrate reach the active site they reach via diffusion right so we know that substrate reach enzyme active site where where diffusion okay where diffusion now when we increase the temperature so we know that the diffusion increases in the chemistry class you will study this in detail that why this happens but if you will increase the temperature the rate of diffusion increases so that's why when we increase the temperature i am representing increase by this so increase temperature what it does it increase the rate of diffusion increase the diffusion rate okay to increase the diffusion rate and once the diffusion rate will be increased then what happen substrate will bind more rapidly to the enzyme right so substrate will bind and enzyme active site very rapidly active site very rapidly right and if it binds very rapidly then what happens then in this case in less time more enzyme will be converted into the product so what happens that in less time more conversion will be happen more substrate will be converted to product right more substrate will be converted to product and because of this reason the activity of enzyme will increase but but if you further increase the temperature so here what i said that increase the temperature to some extent okay not like 
you double or triple the temperature if you increase the temperature to some extent but if you further increase the temperature so if if we further increase the temperature then what will happen if further if you further increase the temperature so in this case what happens enzyme shape will disrupt in this case enzyme or you can write enzyme function or activity decrease decrease or disrupt it can also permanently disrupt now why this happen so why this happen it happens because if you remember enzyme is a protein and we had also studied when we were studying about the enzyme we had studied about the denaturation of the enzyme so enzyme is a protein or enzymes are enzymes are protein mostly remember there are two exceptions but enzymes are mostly proteins okay now what we have studied about the proteins when the temperature is increased so increased temperature what does it do it denatures the protein so it denatures the protein in this case since enzyme is a protein it will denature the enzyme and what the denaturation means denaturation means that the enzyme will come into its native state or the primary state so enzyme will come to primary structure state right primary structure state but we also know that the activity of enzyme takes place when it is in the tertiary structure right so when if it will comes to the primary structure state it won't perform uh, it won't uh, have its enzymatic activity right and hence because its shape will disrupt so the shape of enzyme will disrupt shape of enzyme will disrupt and this will leads to this will leads to decrease in decrease or disruption in activity decrease or disruption in activity so we understood that why upon increasing the, tem the temperature to a certain extent the activity of enzyme increases and now we also saw if we further increase the temperature what will happen and why it will happen right so if we want to represent this thing graphically how will we represent if we want to represent that how temperature functions uh, how temperature affect the activity of enzyme how will we represent we will represent let's represent it so something like this now on the x axis we will have temperature and the y axis what we will have we will have enzyme activity we have we will have enzyme activity so what i said earlier that upon increasing temperature to a certain extent the activity will increase so if you increase temperature to a certain extent the activity is increasing and then if you further increase this temperature the activity will decrease right so this is the temperature now there is a one point when the enzyme will have maximum activity so this is the point in this graph so this point or the temperature at which the enzyme will have maximum activity so this is the point where maximum activity will take place this temperature is known as this temperature is known as optimum one second this temperature will known as optimum temperature okay so this temperature will known as optimum temperature okay so what is optimum temperature if someone ask what is optimum temperature so optimum temperature is the temperature temperature at which enzyme has maximum activity enzyme has maximum activity okay so this is optimum temperature now if we talk about the human body so in human body in human body this optimum temperature is 37 degrees celsius optimum temperature is 
what 37 degree celsius okay so this is the optimum temperature in the case of human body and what we can also see from this graph that above or below this optimum temperature we have low activity right so we have decreasing activity if we look at this point or this point so at this point at this temperature we have less activity at this temperature we have further less activity similarly if we increase the temperature of the optimum temperature again we will have decrease in the activity right so we can write that above or below optimum temperature above or below optimum temperature enzyme activity decreases enzyme activity decreases right and there is certain rule for this okay so let's see what is the rule so we have optimum temperature is 37 degrees celsius right so this is optimum temperature now if you increase the temperature so i am representing that increase or decrease so if you increase the temperature by 10 degrees celsius so suppose your new temperature is 47 degrees celsius similarly if you decrease if you decrease the 10 degrees celsius temperature of the enzyme then it will be 27 degrees celsius this is two conditions further if you increase the temperature for, further say you reach up to 60 to 70 degrees celsius 60 to 70 degrees celsius or if you decrease it such that the temperature reduces below 10 degrees celsius now what conditions we will have so at 37 degrees celsius it is optimum temperature it will have maximum activity so it will have maximum activity now if you increase the temperature by 10 degrees celsius or if you decrease the temperature by 10 degrees celsius what will happen in this case activity will reduce by 50 degree 50% okay so and this activity will reduce by 50% similarly if you decrease the temperature by 10 degree again activity will reduce activity will reduce by 50% okay it will reduce by 50% then if you further think let's increase the temperature more then what happens a certain point will reach when this activity will be completely disrupted okay or yeah, the enzyme will be permanently at this temperature enzyme will be permanently inactive permanently in active now why this will happen i have just told in the previous slide because tertiary structure will disrupt tertiary structure will tertiary structure or we can say shape of the enzyme tertiary structure or shape will disrupt will disrupt right and once the tertiary structure will disrupt then the enzyme will be permanently inactive right now if we go below 10 degrees celsius what happens enzyme will temporarily be inactivated enzyme will get inactivated be inactivated temporarily okay it will be inactivated temporarily now why this will happen because we know that the substrate reaches the enzyme via diffusion but if you will decrease the temperature or if you go below 10 degrees celsius there will be no diffusion a very slow diffusion rate so this will happen because of slow or no diffusion of substrate okay so it will happen because of slow or no diffusion of substrate because at this temperature the substrate will not diffuse and hence it will not bind to the enzyme active site so this is the thing that at optimum temperature there will be maximum activity but if you reduce or increase the temperature by 10 degrees celsius the the activity will reduce by 50% okay and similarly if someone asks that if you decrease the temperature by 10 degrees celsius what will happen then activity will become double what i am trying to say is suppose if you your enzyme is initially kept at 47 degrees celsius 
and if someone asks that what will happen to the activity of the enzyme if it will kept it 37 degrees celsius so there will be 10 degrees celsius difference and in this case the enzyme activity will be doubled okay so you can write it like this so this in this case enzyme enzyme activity enzyme activity 50 percent but if the opposite case is there if the opposite case is there if this is the case if this is the case then what will happen enzyme activity enzyme activity double right enzyme activity will double okay so this is what uh, we studied about the effect of enzyme effect of temperature on enzymatic activity now the next factor is ph so for every enzyme so every enzyme works at a specific ph range okay so every enzyme works at a specific ph range a specific ph range okay and this ph range why because this ph range this ph range maintain the shape of the enzyme it maintains the shape of the enzyme okay it maintains the shape of the enzyme so because of this reason the enzyme works with a specific ph range now what is the optimum ph so like optimum temperature what is optimum ph so optimum ph is what it is a ph ph at which first thing the enzyme maintains its shape enzyme maintains its shape so it is in its native or the original shape so its shape is maintained and secondly have maximum activity have or you can write show maximum activity okay or show maximum activity so this is the optimum ph so uh, let's see certain examples of some enzymes and their optimum ph so for example the salivary amylase the salivary salivary amylase so the optimum ph of salivary amylase is 6.8 okay the optimum ph of pepsin what is the optimum ph of pepsin it is 1.8 that is very acidic because pepsin is present in our stomach now the optimum ph of pepsin is 7.6 that is alkaline in nature so these are certain optimum ph of some enzymes and again if you want to represent it graphically the activity of enzyme with respect to ph change so this is your ph this is this axis is enzyme activity so it will have similar graph as that of substrate okay so its graph will look again it will look something like this okay and this is the ph at which maximum activity is happening this ph is known as this is known as optimum ph okay this is known as optimum ph so this is about the ph now the next factor that affects the enzyme activity is the substrate concentration so how does the enzyme affect the substrate concentration so because we just saw that substrate reach enzyme the substrate reach enzyme via where diffusion right it reaches enzyme via diffusion now we know what is diffusion right so diffusion is nothing but movement of movement of substrate diffusion is movement of substrate substrate from higher concentration from higher concentration to lower concentration right so it is movement of substrate from higher concentration to lower concentration okay so if a substrate is present in large amount right then what will happen 
So if we increase the substrate concentration, if we increase the substrate concentration, so what will happen? Because it moves from a where diffusion it moves from a higher concentration to lower concentration. So upon increasing the substrate concentration, the diffusion diffusion rate will increase, right? So there will be fast diffusion. Fast diffusion to the region where there is low substrate, right? Uh, on the enzyme, there will be low substrate. Then what will happen? It means that because there will be fast diffusion, substrate will bind rapidly to the enzyme. Substrate will bind rapidly to the enzyme, right? Substrate will bind rapidly to the enzyme. And again, there will be faster substrate to product, substrate to product conversion. Now, what does uh, faster substrate to product conversion means? It means the enzyme will have high rate, high conversion rate. Enzyme will have, enzyme will have high conversion rate, conversion rate or catalysis rate. And this conversion rate, it is also known as, it is also called as velocity of the enzyme, right? It is also called as velocity of the enzyme. So if there will be high substrate concentration, the enzyme activity or the enzyme velocity will be high, right? Well, uh, enzyme rate or enzyme velocity will be high. So, but this is the situation. This is the situation, whatever I have just told, this condition will be followed when the enzyme concentration and the enzyme concentration will be greater than substrate concentration. Will be will be greater than substrate concentration. Okay. So this condition will be followed when the enzyme concentration will be greater than the substrate concentration. But there can be a second situation. Okay. There can be a second situation in which they can, this is the first situation. Now there can be a second sub situation in which the substrate concentration, the substrate concentration is higher than enzyme concentration. Okay. So it can be the, there can be the second situation when with the substrate concentration can be higher than the enzyme concentration. So in this case, what will happen? So you have this, suppose you have 10 and five enzymes. You have five enzymes like this, right? You have five enzymes like this and you have a lot number of substrate, a large number of substrate. But for now, since you have only five substrate, the five enzyme, a uh, five enzyme, the five substrate will come and buy. So now it won't matter. However, uh, how much you increase the concentration of the substrate, the enzyme uh, reaction rate will not increase, right? Because all the sub enzyme active site is occupied, right? So, so in this case, what happened that, that if the substrate concentration is very much higher than enzyme concentration, Increase in substrate concentration, in this case, increase in substrate concentration, concentration will not lead to increase in, will not lead to increase in enzyme activity, right? And the, what is the reason? Reason is because all enzymes all enzyme active sites are occupied. All enzyme active sites are occupied. Okay. This is because all enzyme active sites are occupied. So because of this reason, further increase in the substrate concentration will not lead to the increase in the enzyme activity. Now, if we want to represent it in the form so uh, just give me a second i'll continue this in a into five seconds okay yeah so so 
Yeah, so I was telling about the substrate concentration. So what we saw that increase in the substrate con concentration will not lead further in the increase in the enzyme activity when the substrate concentration is greater than the enzyme concentration. And the reason for this is because all enzyme active sites are occupied. Right. So now, if you want to represent it graphically, how will you do this? So for this, let's draw the x and y axis. So this is x and y axis. Now on the x axis, we'll have substrate concentration. On the x axis, we will have substrate concentration. Right? On the x axis, we have substrate concentration. That is also represented something like this. And on the y axis, what we'll have? We can write the rate of enzymatic reaction or the velocity. So on the y axis, we represent it mostly by velocity or V. Right? So what we saw that in the first case, when we'll start increasing the substrate concentration, the enzyme activity will start increasing, right? It will start increasing and it will reach a point after which the substrate concentration will exceed the enzyme concentration and then the enzyme activity will not further increase and it will be saturated, right? So this is the velocity this is the maximum velocity that the enzyme can achieve so this is represented as v max so what is v max v max is the that velocity so what is v max so v max is the velocity or the rate of the reaction of an enzyme when all the when all the active sites of enzyme are occupied and all the active sites of the enzyme are occupied. Okay, so at this uh, uh, velocity, even if you increase the substrate concentration, there will be no increase in the velocity of the enzyme. So Vmax is the dead velocity or dead reaction rate of an enzyme when all the active sites of the enzyme are occupied. It means, what does it mean? It means that all the enzymes are saturated, right? All enzymes are saturated. So now mo no more substrate can bind to the enzyme and hence all the enzymes are saturated. So if we say that suppose if you look at the example, we have 100 enzymes. We need 100 enzymes to reach Vmax. Now, if someone will ask you that what is the substrate concentration at Vmax, we won't, won't be able to determine this. Why? Because you have a range of substrate. For example, from here, here till here, you can say the Vmax can lie between any of this substrate concentration, right? It can be like either this substrate concentration, this, this, this. Okay. So because of this problem, the scientists came up with an, another term that is half Vmax. Okay, so if you look at the enzyme activity, to we, this is your Vmax, this is your Vmax. So when we look at or talk about the enzyme activity, we talk about it in the term of half Vmax. So, so we talk this about in the term of half Vmax. Okay, so just, so this is a Vmax, the y-axis is velocity. And if we talk about what activity of the enzyme, we talk it in the term of half, half Vmax. So what is half Vmax? Half Vmax means that when 50 enzymes are saturated, right? If we have 100 enzymes to reach the Vmax, then 50 enzymes. So when 50 enzymes are occupied, when 50 enzymes are occupied, this is represented by half Vmax, okay? So, this is half Vmax when 50% of the enzymatic activity is reached. So you can write half Vmax is when 50% activity is reached. Now, at what substrate concentration half Vmax is reached? So if we extrapolate this, we can see that this term, this substrate concentration, right? 
and this subset concentration is represented as km okay so what is km km is it is nothing but the concentration of the substrate so this is substrate concentration at which at which enzyme can achieve 50% of its activity right 50% of its activity this is called as k so what is k it is basically the substrate concentration at which the enzyme can achieve the 50% of its activity right or you can also say by this we mean that the 50% enzymes are saturated 50% enzymes are saturated so this is the substrate concentration km is the substrate concentration at which 50% enzymes are saturated okay or you can also write the 50% active sites are filled 50% active sites are filled right so this is this is your uh, km okay and if we talk about the activity of the enzyme we either talk it in the term of half bmh or we talk it in the term of km okay now one more thing that suppose you have two enzymes suppose you have two enzymes and you have graph something like this so you have one enzyme that has graph something like this and then you have second enzyme so this is this is enzyme number 1 this is enzyme number 1 that has km represented by km okay so it has you this is a half bmh this is a half bmh so this is the km of km of first enzyme now you have a second enzyme you have a second enzyme which has which has same bmh as uh, the first enzyme but this enzyme is represented by e2 but if you look at its km so if you look at its km so its km is you can represent it by k dash m so it has k dash m now if someone ask you which enzyme is better so what would be the answer the answer should be that the enzyme which requires less substrate to reach half of the maximum velocity right that enzyme would be better so in this case which enzyme will be better so this is the first enzyme reach this substrate uh, half bmx at km concentration and the second reach it at this k dash m concentration and this k dash m is a substrate concentration that is higher than k right so if you talk about k dash m it is greater than k right so if someone ask you about which enzyme is better in this case so your answer will be the enzyme which has low km because that enzyme will require less substrate to reach the half of the maximum velocity so in this case enzyme 1 is better than 2 is better than e2 because it requires it requires less substrate less substrate to reach half v max so for enzyme to work better it should have low k right so this is what we studied about the factors that affect the enzymatic activity and in this we have studied about temperature ph and substrate concentration now in the next chapter or in the next lecture we'll study about the enzyme inhibition or the inhibitors that reduces or uh, affect the activity of the enzyme so that's all for now thank you